Uh, you often get to sleep. It's fine. There's nothing important there. Um, all right, so um, I'm good. I'm Scott. I work with Automatic. We run WordPress.com. Um, so it's one of the, the largest hosting providers um, in the world. And WordPress itself runs 28% of the internet now, I think. So uh, that's uh, what we test. Um, I'm the lead of our Excellence Wrangler team. Where, uh, we primarily focus on test automation, but also on building a tech a culture of testing across the company and um, raising the minimum level of software quality and wrangling excellence in all the things. Um, as you can see there, Mike, uh, if you can read it, I don't know, but my Twitter handle is at Hoverduck, which is super professional, but it is what it is. Uh, so I'm going to talk today. Oh, and um, there's a link at the top uh, as part of the Google Slides feature where you can log in and uh, ask a question, which I may regret, may regret because there may be too many questions. Uh, but we'll see. Um, so, he said that talk is help your developers help yourselves, help uh, whatever, help your developers help themselves, um, and how to encourage the developers to run run the test suites that uh, you are building QA. And it split the talk up into three main sections. So, uh, chapter one, we started talking about uh, actually defining what the problem is. So, the uh, project I work on. Uh, WordPress.com, a couple years ago, we redesigned our entire front end. It's called Glypso. It's an entirely JavaScript based front end to the WordPress sites. It was all very fancy and slick. Um, and it has great unit tests. The developers are keen to do testing and love being involved in the process, but they don't have end to end integration tests, um, which is what I work on. Um, it just wasn't built with that in mind. So we have, uh, we have some challenges in getting a, that test suite built and keyed into the development process. Uh, we spent the last two years ever since uh, my team was brought on board building up that test suite and trying to connect deeper and deeper into the development workflow so that we can uh, influence the software quality when it comes out the end of the production. So some of the challenges we have is that uh, our tests, we have a separate GitHub repo from the production code uh, that we run that depend in terms of running a separate CI instance on the same system, but uh, again, the code is in a separate baseline, so it's, there's a level of disconnect which makes it hard to link together when the developer makes the code change, and the test fails, it's hard to link that those pieces back together to make sure the developer knows that there was actually a failure type of the change. And then also, this was all had in sort of after the fact that the development has gone on, so the, te the full test suite is only run after the code hits production. So we deploy to production. At that point, the test suite gets kicked off. Um, the whole thing takes uh, about 10 to 12 minutes. And then only at that point does somebody get over that um, there's breakage in production, which is obviously not ideal. And it's something we've been pushing to change over the last years. Um, yeah, and that really just means that, as I said, it's, it's really hard to key that feedback back to the developers to complete that cycle and make sure that they're informed of uh, the results of their changes. Well, um, we built this test suite and we um, have it run, as I said, uh, but there's all those disconnects. Um, we, we tell the developers, hey, we've got this suite, you should run it against your code, and then these are the complaints that come back to it. And don't worry about reading them all and writing them all down. Um, I'm going to go over them in detail in the next couple of slides. Um, but the gist of it is, um, the test environment is too hard to set up. Um, before Chrome Headless came out, uh, we had the, the browser would pop up and interrupt whatever your other workflow is. You can't run the tests in the background and continue coding on the side. Um, it's hard to tell what changes are actually being tested. And is it just my branch, or if they're running against production, and that's everybody's code that's been merged in the last six hours? Um, and then the tests just take too long. And when we first deployed, it would take 20 to 25 minutes to run. And developers just didn't have that, the patience to wait for that to, before emerging. A, a very agile organization that we deploy dozens of times per day at a minute. So it's, it was very difficult for developers to try and wait for, for um, the test to run. So they just wouldn't run them. And then, um, that they would just get picked up by the run in production after deploy. And that's, again, not ideal. But as I said, they love the test. They have great unit tests. They love the feedback. But they just tend to ask us to run the tests for them because it's too hard to set up, it's too hard to run. And they want to just outsource it to the QA team, which isn't typically a problem, but it's not 
as the path of least resistance is not the ideal workflow for any of it. Sh it shouldn't be up to us to run the tests that should all key in automatically. So what's our solution? Um, eliminate the roadblocks. Just take what's inconvenient and what's a hassle for the developers and make it convenient. Um, or make it easy to run early. Um, and the earlier the bugs are found, the easier they are to fix. So addressing those complaints, the test environment is too hard to set up. So you eliminate that setup process by packaging your entire test environment into a single container that can be shipped in code um, anyway. Um, test make instead of having your browser pop up and interrupt your workflow, you um, run it in the virtual environments and hide it behind the scenes using um, a few sort um, a few options I'll get, get into in a minute. Uh, but this is all, of course, before Chrome Headless came out, which also solved that problem to some degree. Um, and then they're, they're complaint that it's, they don't know what changes are being tested when they run. All then we make them run, make it so that it's easier to run the tests against their local branch. They have to test that way. They know exactly what baseline is being tested. Um, the tests take too long. That's actually probably the easiest one on here to solve. But the answer is just increased parallelization. Just run as many tests at the same time as you can. As long as they're not dependent on each other, it should be fine. And it's not as difficult as you may think. To just, you don't have to just throw extra hardware at the problem. There's actually some tools and tricks you can use to increase parallelization without extra costs. So how do we do it? Docker. Docker is the magic that makes everything and everybody's lives easy. Uh, for anyone unfamiliar, Docker is a um, it's a container system, which means you can take an entire system, all of its dependencies and infrastructure, and package it up in code so that you can deploy it anywhere. So instead of having to have a specific server with a specific version of you know, Selenium or Chrome driver installed on it, you have a config file that says download you know, this kernel version with this, this Selenium version with this version of Chrome and Chrome driver, and it's just in config file, it all pulls down automatically and runs the exact same baseline in your local runs, your CI runs, your developer's local runs. And you can run Docker um, on Mac, Linux, and Windows. Um, it itself runs a Linux, basically essentially a tiny Linux VM. So your tests themselves need to be Linux capable, but um, you're, you can run it on your Windows laptop. And I know it's a little intimidating. A lot of people, especially in the test community, are intimidated by Docker and DevOps, and they don't think, you know, I can't do this. I, I just write Python scripts to run automate my tests and that's advanced enough for me, but if you can write a script to automate a browser, you, you can write a config file to define your Docker systems. It's all just bits, it's all the same, it's not as hard as you think. And with Docker we can easily address our first two um, complaints about the test environment being too hard to set up and, and the browser window problem. And the easiest way to do that is with Docker Compose, which is a utility that comes with Docker that you to find this eight-line config file, which I'll go through in a second, and that's all you need to, for your entire test environment. Um, no need to memorize lengthy command line options, everything's contained right in here. So you can see the just a few options here. We've got the Selenium provides a Docker container from the open source project, so you know that you can just get it the standalone Chrome, and the debug option enables the VNC, which actually lets you pop up a window to view into your container and watch the test run. So that way you, you can have both a headless and a head full um, run at the same time. So you can let it go off on its own, but if you have a problem, you can actually let, um, bring up a window and pop and watch it, watch it run and um, preserve the failure. Um, and that debug option there is what enables VNC. 3.3 of that is just a version of Selenium, so if you your tests are coded for 3.3, that's great. If you use an, an older or new version of Selenium, you just change the tag on there and it uh, will automatically download the appropriate version of Selenium. You need to find your network access for Selenium port and VNC port for if you're under the debug. And that's just the port colon port, so 4444 colon 4444 that says that Selenium port inside also make it accessible outside with the same port number. And then the most complicated one, which don't really need to get into is that volumes at the bottom. That's just uh, saying that shared memory for the container and should use the host's memory. You can also look up, the, you can tweak it with an actual value for how much shared memory you use. Uh, like Chrome is picky and crashes if you don't get enough, so that's the easiest way to 
it's all just to share the host name. Um, but once you have that config file defined, it may take you a little while to like, tweak the settings and get that done. But once you do, it's just run Docker Compose up. It brings up a miniature Linux VM, set an environment variable to tell your tests where to find Selenium, and run your test as only. And it will use this tiny Linux VM hiding in the background. Your tests don't pop up. They don't. After work, that you can VNC to watch and run, and it's all pretty seamless. At that point. So, I think that's an environment you have to set up, not anymore. So, a single command line, the developers don't have to maintain a separate environment um, on their laptop uh, next to their development board. And uh, as a bonus, you can see that uh, this is the same exact uh, container we use in CI that we use, in, um, use on our local runs, and there's no excuse to say. This works on my machine, the tests are failing on CI, but they're not failing locally. It's all exactly the same, so you know you get one place you get everywhere else. Uh, so that was the first two entries on our list of complaints. Um, going a little bit further, um, you have to dig a little bit deeper into Docker, so it gets a little bit more complicated, but it's still not anything too technical. Uh, second half, and then issues on our list, um, not being clear which changes are tested and the test picked too long. So if I look at the last one, I work our way back. Or I put these out of order, that would be easier to talk around than actually change the slides. Um, so increased parallelization, that's the, like the easiest way. Um, the first thought is you just throw more hardware at it if you can have you know, a dozen servers running your tests, or a dozen chrome instances, and I'm sure that speed things up a lot. But um, this, was a, this is pulled from our CI system um, without adding any additional hardware. We just we were able to increase our parallelization and cut our execution time in half. Um, our tests run um, in a JavaScript stack. We use Node.js with a Mocha test runner. Um, on top of that, we added Magellan, which is a, another open source JavaScript library, which is actually provided by Walmart Labs. Well, people. Um, it's a great piece of software, and it handles all of our parallel test runs. Um, runs all of them in individual instances and compiles the results back, so we don't have to deal with duplication or Figuring out time versus between different test runs, the Magellan handles that all for us. So if you're on a JavaScript stack, I highly recommend it. If you're on another stack, I'm sure there are uh, comparable projects for other systems. Uh, and just another area, it was a really sad day for me when this, uh, our timeline here dropped off the edge with a big drop in the new lower level within the baseline because it, I really like being able to point to that and say, hey, I did that. And, uh, but, you know, new baseline is good to um, so for the last last issue, developers have testing specific changes, getting a test run locally against a local branch. Um, it's, it is complicated and dependent on whatever your application really is. Um, ours is a web front end, so it's easy to like, spin up a little web server locally um, if you're doing you know, you know, dedicated device testing. It's a little bit more difficult, but uh, every application is unique. Uh, but if you're doing anything with the network, Traffic. All you need to do, you can dockerize pretty much anything. Um, add your application server, your database server, whatever you need into that config, and now your tests and your app will run on their own private network. With a little bit of aliasing, you can your tests and your app will think that they're running against production. Um, they won't know any other any difference, and everything the developers will know that they can. Uh, oh, so the other point. If your application isn't currently Dockerized, really not much reason not to, unless you're um, dealing with some, with some very specific applications. Um, you should look for anyone in your organization who is a Docker enthusiast. I guarantee you there's somebody on your team who wants to Dockerize everything. Uh, on my team, that's me. So, um, But if you just ask around, I'm sure somebody has thought about it and wants to put it in action. I mean, it's, it's been a buzzword for the last five or six years, but it's it just keeps on getting bigger and bigger. And, um, whether it's Docker or not, the, being a, a container system is the way of the future and the way services are going. So find find that person, and they will they will help you Dockerize your test setup as well. Uh, oh, and that, well, once you have that setup, it's not just for your end-to-end uh, -end test that's useful. It's also Makes it makes development easier, makes manual testing easier. 
it really just makes uh, makes everyone's life easier to have a containerized setup that you can run the same exact code, the same exact infrastructure, everywhere. It simplifies everything. So to wrap it up, uh, there should be something else. Oh, there we go. So the so it's, is it not, it's not clear which set of changes are being tested. They, if they're running their local branch on from their Docker container alongside your Docker container tests, they know exactly what's been being tested. Um, it doesn't take too long, obviously, you just run more tests at a time. Uh, it's not as expensive hardware wise as you may think. Um, there's really no excuse not to explore that option. And uh, we did it. So, um, that is all I have. I you guys may talk a little bit past Apologize. Um, that's me and where you can find me. Um, maybe hard to read about that. Swap box cancel like automatic with two T's. Um, so I do not have any questions in the speaker's name, except a manual test, which I will come with. So uh, I will ask you. We do, um, and part of the reason is that um, along the lines we've also uh, expanded our test suite to handle more than just the core product of our web front end. So we use we share code between uh, that Calypso front end and also the, the Jetpack plugin front end and the WooCommerce plugin front end. And it's just, there's so much shared code between several different projects that now our test repo has become more central to other things. So. There is room we could probably refactor and have a common code in the repo and then you know, product specific code in the product repo. But it's it's just how the project's grown up and it's so far it hasn't been a big deal to work through and we have we just get sub modules and a lot of web hooks passing back and forth. And we're, uh, we're making progress, but yeah, it's not like Yeah, yeah. Um, which, so typically the way the way it works is that the developer will make a change, and if they if they're keyed into the test as they should be, they'll know, hey, you guys should check check out this change. It's going to break the test. They'll let us know. We'll look at it. We'll make the changes, and then yeah, we we'll just coordinate manually. Okay, I'm going to merge this on Tuesday, and we merge our change on Tuesday. Um, so a lot of times the, that sort of thing is also done in an A/B test on production. So they'll actually merge their code in into production under an A-B test, and we have triggers in our code to say, this is an unrecognized A-B test, let's stay, take the safe path and we know the, safe, the flow that's already there. So we just ignore the new code until somebody says, hey, this A-B test is going to flip from and then we, then we, we have that there. It's a fork of Chrome. I couldn't explain it. Um, running it inside a Docker container with the default parameters, um, it just would constantly crash on me about how they throw tests. Um, and there is some magic number of shared memory I can allocate to it. I just didn't know how to figure that out. And just said, use the host memory and uh, solve the problem. And it, it's, it's a stack overflow solution. They um, do the right enough, and that's, what, that's the standard answer. Uh, well, just we have a, a Slack channel set up that gets alerts with screenshots of the failures. Um, so when somebody when the alerts start coming out, we can look at the channel and see. Uh, my my change went in ten months ago. This is I got a screenshot of the editor. I changed the editor. They can see where the failure.
we, tip, we focus everything on Chrome because that's the most common. Uh, we do some um, multi-browser tests for, to check visual differences. So we just look at the layouts of the page and make sure that we don't have you know, divs, you know, overlying boundaries and stuff like that. But we, we personally don't run functional tests on anything like Chrome because the, the test maintenance is too high to make sure it always runs good style browsing. We, we just follow Chrome as far as functional. We have we just had very few issues. Um, and I use specific ones on the ones that do pop up. But the, the number of issues we have on different browsers are low enough that it's not worth our investment to keep it out there. I think mean, that's application dependent. Yeah. Yeah. You could, and like the uh, just in the config. Yeah, instead, instead of Chrome, you could say, like, Internet Explorer is difficult because it's Windows and you dot those in space. Uh, so for that, you would need, like, a sauce or something else. But, um, they, they have um, Chrome and Firefox and all that. Um, it's running for that. Well. Okay. Talking about their like the development code or the test code? Did it be there? Well, I mean, the, yeah. Well, the easiest is to just build your Docker config to automatically. Um, if you're if you're doing building it for a local test run, you can just um, basically mount it directly inside the container to point at your at the developer's code in that folder. Uh, if it's something you're going to deploy to CI, then you have a step in the beginning of your init to do a git pull to pull down your source code. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> uh, anything is too long for it. Um, our initially in our test suite was taking 20 to 25 minutes uh, to fully complete, um, and that's that was just for a single screen size. We also typically run a mobile uh, desktop and a mobile screen size, so it's 40 minutes to an hour. So that, that that was too long for the developer to kick off the test and wait. When the browser windows are popping up and interrupting the browser, can't do other things. Um, and I mean, our, our long-term goal is to ship it off entirely onto the CI server. Press a button and kick it off remotely. Getting it where they can run it locally and being sure exactly what they're running. First, I put it on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, ideally your environment, like, as far as being production and QA and staging, it should be just like an environment variable to it. So then you, you spin up your container with a you know, staging flag, right? so it pulls the staging and you can Some people have, some have, that's, that's a personality thing. Um, like I said, our teams have been very enthusiastic about the unit tests, so they are all keyed into testing in general. Um, the N10 test is um, mostly an issue for them being like the, the long execution times and the setup and all that that I went through. So uh, we've eliminated as many of the root boxes as we can to get them running the tests, and then you know, it hasn't taken off as much as I'd like, but the idea is if they can see, you know, 
the test run easily and then it breaks because my, I made a change that breaks the test and they can go in easily and fix it so that it pass. That hasn't happened yet as much as I'd like, but uh, it's a long road. We're getting there. Thanks, everybody.